Hello, good morning or afternoon or evening or wherever you might be. Uh, today, we're going to cover up the lessons that were done this week uh, and finished with the even periods uh, today on Friday, October 23rd. Uh, a couple of announcement type uh, announcements to go through first. Um, first and foremost, our test is available now to take. Please complete it before the 30th. We'll have time set aside in class to do this, but the more people that do it before class, the faster we can move on. Uh, either way, we'll have class, we'll have time in class to do this. It's a 45 minute test, 20 questions, um, five of which are short answer, 15 of which are multiple choice style questions. So uh, make sure you get a, get a look at that. Uh, today's plan is to finish off the unit one assessment study guide. At this point, all classes have done it. And so we are just going to go through these answers and just confirm. Uh, this week, we finished off assignment six. You have the last question there to answer. And this Friday, assignment five is due. Let's head on over to our evidence notebook, always located at the front right here. And let's get started here. So as I just said, assignment five is due. If we are following along in class, you're already at a three out of five. Our chart is complete. The analysis is complete. Conclusions are what we're heading towards right now. So you guys have to finish that off and finish that off by today. Um, we finished off mixtures this Monday. Uh, it's a cut down version of our traditional assignment, but you have that last question to answer and that will be due by the 30th. So our study guide. Um, so the assessment will be available until the 30th. So please make sure it's completed by then. Otherwise, it will be marked as a zero until it is done. Uh, this review is meant to prepare you for it. Your test is about 20 questions. This one here is about nine. Uh, finally, make sure your notes are completed. Off to the side here of my, uh, the class notebook, we have all of this stuff. We have six assignments, about as many notes. We got a review. We got a study guide. So it's a pretty dense uh, document right now. Um, so make sure yours looks almost similar to mine. If your notes aren't complete, go back into the Schoology notebook and find the notes that you're missing. Make sure you have them. All righty. So we'll get started with our topics here. What can we expect? Pretty much everything that was talked about this unit. Constraints, the units of measurement, measuring mass and volume, density, percent error, energy transfers, that's a big one. Uh, scientific notation, states of matter, another big one. Physical and ke uh, chemical changes, yet another uh, big one. And finally, we have those pure substances versus mixtures. And so with our first question, we're gonna be talking about constraints. This is talked about in assignment one. So it's been a, it's been a minute since we talked about it. Uh, what are some examples of constraints and what is a similar word? So straight up the definition of constraint is essentially it's a limitation or restriction that is placed upon you. And it's most relevant when we're talking about designing a project for an engineering, uh, an engineering type project. And the biggest constraints that we'll typically face when we're designing any kind of product are time and budget. Now, I don't mean to sound crass or anything, but that's what it usually comes down to. You could be a CEO of a huge corporation, huge conglomerate, and at the end of the day, the budget is something you always have to consider. Time as well, right? But given enough time and money, you can pretty much do anything, but you know, you never have enough time or money. And so our constraints here, our limits are typically those things and you typically can't go wrong if, uh, as far as the test goes, if there's an option about time or money, that's typically your constraint. Other things like, let's say you're designing a dress, right? The color choice of that dress is not exactly a constraint. That's more of a criteria, uh, a goal to work towards. Um, if you're building your own computer, CPU speeds are a goal to work towards, not a constraint. Okay, let's move forward. Uh, converting units. This was our notes uh, right after assignment two, and we're going to use this guide here. So if I have 120 centimeters, to convert it to kilometers, hectometers, decimeters, or regular meters. Let's just go with the first one. Convert it 
centimeters and two decimeters, we have our 120 centimeters. We're just gonna multiply it by one tenth, right? One tenth times uh, 120 will give us about 12 decimeters, which is accurate. Keep going. If I want to turn centimeters into uh, regular meters, we just multiply it by one and one hundred, right? So we're going to get rid of our units by multiplying it by the unit. So if centimeter, we want to get rid of it, use the one over one hundred. So one point one hundred twenty times one over one hundred, one point two, which is about accurate. One hundred centimeters is one meter. So 120 centimeters is about 1.2 meters. Let's keep going. If I want to turn centimeters into hectometers, first I'm going to multiply by one over 100, and then I'm going to divide it, divide whatever answer I got, so 1.2, divide that by 100. And then again, if I want to turn it into kilos, divide 1.2 by 1,000. Um, and let's go ahead and fill that in, and it's right there. 120 centimeters is equal to 0 0.0012 kilometers, 12 decimeters, 0 0.012 hectometers, and 1.2 meters. I should have just put this in order, but I decided to be extra about it. My bad. All right. For question number three, we're talking about density. A student measures the mass and volume of an object to be 26.34 grams and 50 milliliters. We're not talking about uh, we're not talking about significant figures here, but if we were, our final answer should be two significant figures. This one here is our smallest amount, so our final answer will also be two significant figures. What is the density of this object? And so to figure that out, we're going to look at assignment number three. We have our formula for density. Density is mass over volume, and so that's what we're going to do. Mass over volume, 26.34 divided by 50. That's about 0.53 grams per milliliter. Done. The second portion of this question asks us what is the percent error if the actual density is 0.63. So we're going to look at assignment four and figure out the percent error. Here we go. Here's the formula. We take the value experimental. So what we did, what we got through our own observations and calculations, and then the accepted value. Make sure those are on top and bottom, multiply by 100, and there we go. So 0.53 minus 0.62 divided by 0.62 will give us about 0.15 times 100. It's about 15%. So this here is a very inaccurate uh, measurement, uh, much higher than 5%, higher than 10% even. And so we can't really put a lot of stock on this, right? This is a a very inaccurate result, we would have to do this over again if we were uh, actually measuring the density here. Okay, moving on. Describe what happens to the bonds between particles of water in ice as it heats up. And so my favorite metaphor uh, here is, imagine what happens to you and your friends after high school. Those bonds of friendship will get weaker and weaker and eventually you'll fall farther apart. Now, that's a very depressing take on it, and for a more accurate and more scientific take on these uh, measures, uh, these bonds and their strengths, let's take a look at our notes on physical and chemical changes. We have our drawing of our particles, right? We have ice, then water, then gas. And we can see that as heat is added, those bonds will slowly loosen until we get particles that flow right past each other. And then they'll eventually break and turn into steam. And that's kind of where the energy goes. Whenever we add heat, remember, we're adding thermal energy. And that energy is used to break those bonds and then energize those particles to the point where that they're flying around in our container. But if we're just talking about the bonds here, uh, the idea is that these bonds will separate and get further apart, right? They're first going to get weaker, though. Well, first get weaker and then separate and get farther apart. So for number five, and we're really just going through these, uh, what is scientific notation used for? This is our notes right before our quiz on scientific notation. And what were they really used for? If we have like a number like 52.7, we don't really need it. It adds a layer of complexity that's just not needed. But in terms of chemistry, in terms of uh, 
the, the scale of the numbers we use, uh, they come in really, really handy. So if you have a mole, which is 602, I think septillion uh, is a number with 21 zeros after it, that is a pain in the butt to write out every single time and even to do math with. And so we just use scientific notation. This is 21 zeros. And so we don't have 21 here because we move our decimal places two points right up to the six. And so that's why it's 23. 21 plus two, 23. And so we take scientific notation to turn really, really large numbers into more manageable ones. Okay. Uh, for number six, we're looking at a list of actions that can only create physical changes, right? So if you take some paper and you shred it, you still have paper. The identity of the thing you shred is still paper. If you ripped up the paper, same thing, it's still paper. Crush it into a little ball, still paper. Tearing it, still paper. Holding it, still paper. Soaking it, that's depending, right? If you take a sponge and you soak it in water, the sponge gets bigger, but at the end of the day, it's still a sponge. Uh, it depends on if there's a color change, right? Does the dye go through? Typically, if that happens, that's a color change. But the bigger uh, symbol for a physical change, the, the emphasis that I'm going to be placing it on, is a state of matter change. If you have a solid turn into a liquid, or a liquid turn into a solid, there's your physical change, right? So freezing, boiling, melting, con condensation. I could just say condensing, right? These are all examples of physical change, and sometimes they're accompanied by chemical changes. And so let's take number seven, which is what changes do you see when a log is burned? And so I asked several classes this, and this is what we typically get. We get ashes, we get heat, we get color changes, right? Our log becomes black. Uh, smoke, right? Our log is turned into smoke. Our layers of our uh, wood start to separate off and peel off. We get some charcoal going. And so the biggest chemical changes that we are seeing is that our wood is being turned into something else, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. It's a whole host of chemical changes that are happening. We know this because all these things previously that we just said, ashes, heat, color change, those are all signs of chemical changes. One of the biggest one is the heat. Anytime you have an output of heat or an input of heat, those are chemical changes. The physical change that we see is a solid being turned into a gas, right? You have a log that turns into smoke. That's a big, uh, big change as far as, uh, as far as the physical, you know, identity of that object is. And so we're going to move on here to number eight. List extensive and intensive properties. And to do this, we're just going to go back to our notes on intensive and extensive properties. And we have them already listed out. Mass, volume, size, shape. These are all dependent on how much of something you have, right? Let's say you eat 20 pounds of food. Okay, now your mass has grown. It's dependent on what you put into your body, right? How much substance you have. Your volume gets bigger if you eat 20 pounds worth of food. Your size and shape definitely change if you eat 20 pounds of food. Other things like color, taste, density, those are, um, those are a part of just being that object, right? So if you took like Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola, if you have a tablespoon of it or a two liter bottle of it, the color is still black. The taste still tastes like Coke. The density is still uh, rather dense, like one point, I think you said five, nine. And so density, color, taste, all dependent on just the uh, substance itself, not how much of that substance you have. And so if we also talk about melting point and boiling point, these are other like intrinsic values, right? They're intensive because it's just a part of that object's identity. And so we just list those out, our extensive and intensive properties. Are listed out right there. If we're talking about metals, by the way, uh, a metal's shininess, its luster, is a, another aspect of an intensive property. Its hardness, right? Some metals are really hard, some are really soft. 
If you've played Minecraft, you know that gold is really shiny, but it's also really, really weak. Iron, not so shiny, but really, really strong. So luster and hardness are aspects that we typically talk about with metals. And now we're on the last question. Uh, if you're wondering why I'm going so quickly, it's because we're doing a study guide. I already have the answers popped out. So I'm not really like doing a back and forth with the class. So it's, it, takes a less, it takes a bit less time. On the right side, there's less video for you guys to watch. So upsides and downsides. So what is the difference between a mixture and a pure substance? To answer this question, we're going to look at assignment number six. A pure substance is an object with fixed composition. So if I took water, even though that's hydrogen and oxygen, right, H2O, even though it's hydrogen and oxygen, water will remain in a configuration, right? So that oxygen surrounded by two water molecules are water atoms, and all water is going to be shaped like that. It's uniform and it's fixed, all water will have H2 and then O. And so if we're talking about pure substances, pure substances are pretty much fixed. They stay as they are. A mixture is a blend of two or more types of substances, and each of those substances kind of keep their own properties. So if you ever eat like a smoothie, and it's got like strawberries, bananas, and blueberries, uh, and you drink it, uh, and but you're allergic to blueberries, a reason you are going to not have a good time is because those blueberries kept their properties, right? They're still going to make you allergic and you're going to need an EpiPen real soon. Uh, a pure substance wouldn't have that happen unless you're you know, allergic to water or something. And so the next follow-up questions are carbon dioxide and air. Carbon dioxide is just carbon dioxide. Those atoms are shaped Right, CO2, it's got an oxygen molecule, an oxygen molecule, and a carbon in the middle. And every single particle inside, let's say you have a bag of carbon dioxide, every single particle is going to have oxygen, oxygen, and carbon. Every single one. And that makes it pure. Uh, air, however, is a mixture. It's got water in the clouds. It's got oxygen we can breathe. It's carbon dioxide that we breathe out. There's methane from all the cows that exist, viruses, pollution, sulfur, right? We've got so much stuff in the air, it's got to be a mixture. So speaking of mix mixtures, we have to talk about the different kinds. So if I have coffee, for example, I have coffee, which is milk, cream, sugar, coffee beans, um, water, right? So I've got a lot of stuff inside of coffee. And so I got to differentiate it. Is it homogenous or is it heterogeneous? The difference here, the way you figure this out is, imagine you're taking a sip of coffee. Then you take another one. Those two sips are going to be pretty much exactly the same. And if it's the same, we could say it's homogenous. Homo uh, homogenous meaning same, right? It's got the same composition all throughout. It's very uniformly distributed. Right? But some mashed potatoes, on the other hand, you have potatoes, cream, butter, uh, salt, pepper, gravy. And so you take a bite of it, and then you take a second bite. It's not uniformly distributed. That second bite might be different from your first bite. And if it's different, it's heterogeneous. Hetero meaning different, homo meaning same. So think about that kind of metaphor. If we're Take a bite out of some stainless steel. Stainless steel is carbon, iron, and chromium in varying amounts. If we take a bite out of it, we could say it's homogenous because our second bite would also taste like, how you say, uh, the same. You're going to have equal amounts all throughout. Salad, though. Let's take a salad. A salad is one first bite, our lettuce. Second bite, maybe some chicken. Third bite, maybe some tomatoes. And so every bite is different. And so that's going to mean it's heterogeneous. Um, heterogeneous, just the difference between these two are basically, is the composition uniform? Basically, is it all the same throughout the mixture? Air is a homogeneous, or is a, let's say this way, air is a heterogeneous mixture depending on where you're at, right? If you go up to the mountains, you're most likely going to be getting 
uh, a very homogenous mixture of uh, how you say uh, oxygen versus pollution. Whereas if we go to, I don't know, downtown Los Angeles, you're going to get a lungful of uh, pollution, car pollution. And so in that respect, it is uh, heterogeneous. But depending on where you're at, it, it shifts. And so you got to keep that in mind. A nice rule of thumb, though, is is the, is the composition uniform? And then when we come back to pure substances, pretty much if it's a crystal, you're going to be seeing uh, you're going to be able to call it a pure substance. So sugar, even though it's made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, everything is set up in a specific order. And so all of those crystals will share that same specific order, which means that this is a pure substance. Salt, excuse me, salt, sodium chloride, all those crystals have sodium and chlorine. And they're all uniformly just like that. Aluminum is a pure element, so we just call it aluminum. And so that's what the study guide is going to be about. Um, a big portion of this test is going to be on the newer stuff, be like 10 ish questions. Uh, the rest of it will be on older stuff, so I pretty much split it half half. So I uh, hope you enjoyed this video. Be aware that assignment five is due this Friday, October 23rd. Other than that, I'll see you all later, hopefully in class. And if not, I hope this video helped you out. Bye-bye uh, and have a wonderful rest of your day.